You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. And so I think that's really maybe the biggest lesson that I took away from it was really just having that kind of humility um, when you go into these kinds of bigger meetings or, um, you know, recognizing that the job of it all is sort of under the auspices of somebody else and that kind of at any moment, like that job could go away and it's pretty much up to them to tell you notes and it's up to you to take them. So um, as a writer and even as a showrunner, you're really definitely still under the control of the network and or studio. Um, so that's definitely a big thing that I learned from from both of those writers' assistant jobs. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Before I get started with the show, I want to give a shout out to Alex Ferrari and his latest Udemy course on screenwriting, Screenwriting and the Story Blueprint, The Hero's Two Journeys. I'll link to the course in the show notes as you can join the course for the special launch price of $25. There's no coupon needed. And speaking of Udemy, would any of you listeners out there be interested if I started a Udemy course on podcasting or what if I started a podcast camp? Please let me know. Uh, you know, I'm open for ideas. Some people have been actually, you know, inquiring if I was ever going to start a course because I've kind of mentioned it sometimes here on the show. For the 100th episode, I am definitely going to release like a podcast checklist type deal. It'll be free for everyone. It would never cost anything. But other than that, if you ever wanted to go deeper with this, please let me know. It's Dave at DaveBullis.com. On this episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast, we have Miranda Sajak. Miranda Sajak is a film writer and producer and currently living in Los Angeles. And she recently joined with producer Sandra Levinson to co-found Script Chicks and Under the Stairs Entertainment. And she currently has a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for her next project. So without further ado, here is episode 95 of the Dave Bullis Podcast. <laughs> Dave Bullis Podcast. Miranda, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, thank you. So everyone, this is the first test of the new board. So if something sounds funky, uh, it's completely my fault, but I'm going to try my best to blame everybody else. Um, so, <laughs> so Miranda, just to get started, the same question I always ask everybody is, you know, how did you get started in the film industry? Um, that is a great question. Uh, so when I was a kid, uh, my mom took me to see the movies and um, the first live action film other than like, you know, your sort of standard Disney animation that all kids see um, that she took me to see was A League of Their Own, uh, which, you know, is the sort of baseball movie um, about women in the 40s um, becoming baseball players when the men went overseas to fight in World War II. So stars like Gina Davis and Rosie O'Donnell and Madonna and Tom Hanks. And if you haven't seen it, it's really amazing. Um, but that movie just totally inspired me. And I left the theater saying, like, I want to make movies. I want to be a filmmaker. That's what I want to do with my life. Um, and literally has not changed since then. Um, I've certainly gone through various stages where I've been a writer and a director and a producer, and I've worked in pretty much every set department there is. Um, but it was that moment that said to me, this is the industry I want to be in, and this is why. So, Now, I, I wanted to ask, did you go to film school? I did. I went to Columbia undergrad. So now, now this is the million-dollar question, Miranda. I've always asked this to people who've gone to film school. Yes. You know, do you think it is necessary to go – to be in the film industry – and this is an open-ended question. I mean, in any capacity, do you feel it's necessary to go to film school? I am right down the middle with that. And there's a couple of reasons. Um, I think it's very dependent on what you want to do in film um, and what your ultimate end goals are. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think that there are things that can be very useful about film school. Um, one of those things is, you know, just the basic networking of having a lot of people on your level who you can connect with and then later work with. Um, I think that's useful. I think that's a, a big reason why a lot of people end up going. Um, and then, of course, the resources of any film school to later connect you with jobs or internships or, um, you know, the kind of work that you may want in the industry. Um, additionally, I think that there is certainly use to the apprenticeship function of film school, whether that is, you know, learning how to use a camera, learning set etiquette, learning 
um, you know, even just studying films so that you know the history of film or, you know, um, you understand film theory or, uh, you know, sort of the literature behind it all. Um, I think there is definitely use to those things. And I think that those are things that you could learn on your own and that a lot of people do learn on their own without going to film school. Um, I think for me, what was most beneficial was really having teachers who were, or professors really, who were um, really culling down the massive amounts of literature and um, films out there into you know, what they felt were important um, pieces of information to have processed and understand in order to go into the industry. And then also really learning set etiquette and, um, you know, learning the different jobs on set and how they work and kind of knowing all of that stuff before going into the industry. So, um, for example, while I was undergrad at Columbia, I worked on a lot of graduate student films um, as, you know, anything from a PA to an AD. And then, um, I went on and was able to take all of those skills to PA on Born Ultimatum and Cloverfield and a number of big films that were shooting in LA or in New York at the time. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do that with those same level of skills if I hadn't had that training. So I think there is certainly a benefit. On the other hand, um, to play my own devil's advocate, I recognize that it is not a necessity for every job. And I don't think that it is a necessity in general. Um, I've certainly known any number of people who have not gone through film school who are doing perfectly fine in the industry um, and any number of people who, uh, you know, just learn on the job. Uh, and, and it just, it very much depends on what you want to do and how you, how your path is and how you want your path to be. And I would never say that it is a necessity, um, but I would also say that it can be useful for some people. That is one thing I always ask some of my guests is about film school because yeah. some people feel very strongly about it on the one hand. Yeah. And on the other hand, some people say, you know, if I could go back, I may just have just started off as a PA. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Like meaning just from high school, go right into the film industry yeah. and go on to wherever I had to, to just apply to be a PA. Work as much as at, possible. Yeah. Exactly. And then just work my way up and then just sort of from a, being a PA, just sort of find out what I want to do and go that way. Yeah. And then sort of, you know, sort of balances itself out because that way I can learn set etiquette while I'm doing and yeah. you know, things like that. But I agree with you though. It is a good way to network. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it is, it does actually teach you set etiquette, yeah. which if you want to set, if you go on a set for the first time, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it could be a culture shock for some yeah. people because they're not used to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's pros and cons and I, and it's always just a, a good, uh, you know, food for thought question I like to ask. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think it's a question I'm not sure that we'll ever fully answer because um, I really do think it is an individual basis. I think, you know, there are people who it works amazingly for, um, you know, D. Reese at NYU and, you know, um, then getting Pariah and Bessie and she's just kind of had an amazing career based on her connections that she made there, um, you know, versus you know, like a Spielberg or, you know, um, somebody kind of starting out in the early days, like an Orson Welles or whatever, when there, there wasn't film school and yet he still made Citizen Kane, you know? So I think it's not a necessity, but I, I certainly think that there are, um, times when it can be useful for sure. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, you mentioned, uh, you know, your PA work, which I wanted to ask about, you know, you got to be a PA on Cloverfield and the Bourne Ultimatum. Yeah. So, you know, how were you able to, you know, get a job as a PA on those on those sets? Um, that was back when I was in New York. So that would have been right around the time I graduated from college. And that was uh, either networking. Um, so I think one of them was a referral from maybe the other one or from something I'd done similarly. Um, and then one of them, I think I applied either uh, through the production office or um, through a job posting, but I think I, I applied through the production office because I know at the time, and I'm not sure if they still do this, I haven't lived in New York for a lot of years, but um, at the time, the mayor's office of the film would kind of release a list of job openings, and then you'd sort of have your standard list of like what productions are shooting in town right now, and you could um, essentially message the production office and just say like, hey, I'm around, do you guys need PAs kind of thing, uh, and I think that's how I got the first one of those. And then the second one, I think, was just a referral. So a lot of jobs in the industry are really just networking and who you know. Yeah, that is something that, you know, doing this podcast, a lot of guests have said as well. Yeah. They've uh, It's all about who you know. And uh, there's a quote that I always screw up, but I think it is, your net worth is your network. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
So what are some of the things that you learned while being a PA? I mean, obviously those two movies, the budget for the Bourne Ultimatum was probably, you know, 20 to 30 million. Cloverfield, I'm going to guess, you know, 20 to 30 million as well. So, you know, it was obviously much bigger than an independent shoot. Yes. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting to, you know, pretty big scale here. So what are some of the things that you've learned, you know, being a part of a, of a crew that size? Um, you know, it's interesting because I pretty much have always been working simultaneously on independent projects and studio projects um, to an extent. Like I've sort of kind of kept that up, even moving to L.A. Um, in the development world. So, you know, I think uh, what I find really fascinating and what's what I love kind of about both of them is that, um, you know, they're both doing essentially the same thing, but often um, in slightly different ways. Um, for instance, uh, like a Cloverfield or a Born Ultimatum or a studio project, um, you know, it's going to be a union project. It's going to have much bigger departments, much more people in each department. Um, you know, you're going to have days where you're spending a lot more time on a certain shot, um, whereas an independent film you may have to steal a shot. Um, you know, you'll sometimes see a director or a producer moving a light, which, you know, would never happen on a union film. Um, just, you know, union rules and everything else just sort of requiring that, um, you know, G&E kind of takes care of that. So um, it's sort of, a, it's just, it's doing things on a different scale, I think. And I think that um, one of the things I love about independent film is the ability to, really be hands-on and be involved in every department and, you know, have that sort of um, tactile ability to really be in, involved in like literally everything. But I will also say there's a definite benefit, obviously, to the studio feature, just budgetary elements where uh, you can kind of say, hey, uh, you know, makeup department, deal with this. And you don't have to worry about um, you know, having a makeup kit yourself that you're applying to your actor while you're trying to direct them. So, you know, I think that there's, uh, there's good and bad elements to both. Um, but I would definitely say that, you know, the studio projects are able to do a lot more, um, you know, even though today in the digital space, indie projects are catching up very rapidly. You mentioned uh, the unions. That is one thing that I... <laughs> Uh, from doing like student projects, by the way, just to, to let you know, I never went to film school. I went to, I chose the weirder path. I went to business school. Oh. Um, <laughs> so uh, some people, I mean, that's good. yeah, some people are like, well, that's a good thing. And I'm like, uh, you know, it was like, I had my own, my own weird way of getting there. And some of the weird stories I have about going to business school, but um, that is one thing, you know, when I was in business school, I was doing student films and stuff like that. And I was helping friends out. And then when I finally did like my first professional film that was mine, not going on anybody else's set, that's the first thing I was like, okay, introduction to how to deal with the unions. Yeah. And I don't mean like at that in a bad way, because I know it's that sounded kind of negative, but okay, this is, you know, you have to have this many breaks, this, this, it was actually, cause we, we did a, um, a SAG new media agreement yeah. for the actors. And that was actually pretty easy to get, you know, to yeah. just to, to get, and you know, there wasn't really a lot of hoops we had to jump through. And then just, you know, a couple of things here and there. So, so it was actually a pretty easy time on our end. But, you know, but going on to the other sets, you know, you see all these different, you know, unions doing different things. And I think a lot of times that that, that sort of blows people's minds yeah. uh, who, who, have, who aren't used to sets like that. Yeah. And there's, you know, meal penalties and there are certain rules that unions impose upon the set. And then, of course, there's, you know, um, even just from a budgetary standpoint, there's the extra money that goes into hiring a union crew um, for fringes and benefits and pensions and all of that stuff that you kind of have to pay on top of just the salary, uh, which doesn't always come into play on an independent set. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a different world and it's a different scale, but it's essentially doing the same thing. It's working towards the same kind of goal. So talking about your career, you know, from, you know, being a PA and you know, doing all sorts of different work, you know, you ended up becoming a writer's assistant. Yeah. And you got to be a writer's assistant on a show I really enjoy, China, Illinois. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, how did you get to be a writer's assistant on China, Illinois? Um, yeah. I mean, the writer's assistant stuff uh, started a few years before that. Um, the first writer's assistant job, or I guess it was a show owner's assistant job I had was on um, Huge, which was an ABC family show. Um which was uh, created by Savannah Dooley and Winnie Holzman, who um, created My So-Called Life and wrote the script for Wicked and 
is currently working on the Wicked musical and is doing a lot of other fun stuff. Um, so that was sort of my first writer's assistant job. And that was another one of those, you know, your network is your net worth kind of things where um, I was already friends with uh, Savannah and then I knew Winnie through her. Um, so that was sort of how I got that job. And then the China, Illinois job um, was just a, a job application. Um, it was posted on a site that they were looking for a script coordinator and I was sort of in between gigs and kind of hadn't really done something like that in a little while. So it was one of those, sure, I'll shoot over my resume and see what happens. And uh, something like a few days later, they called me in and I got the job the same day I interviewed. So that was a pretty fast process. Um, and they were, I think, in the middle of their second season. So I was sort of coming on in the middle of things. Um, and that was really a, a really great learning experience. Um, everybody on that team is amazing. They're so funny and they're so smart. And, um, you know, they have a really unique tone to their show. I mean, you know, as a fan um, that they're very specific uh, with what they do and with their jokes. And uh, and I hadn't really worked heavily in comedy before. So that was really enjoyable to be able to step both into animation and comedy at the same time, which I hadn't really had the chance to do. So um, yeah, I mean, it was a totally, it's, it's very different from working in live action, but I actually really enjoyed it, uh, actually a lot more than I thought I even would to begin with. So, I mean, I love all those guys. It's a great show and I hope it has many, many more years to go. Cause it's just really, really unique storytelling. You know, sadly, Miranda, I actually think they've decided to not do any more seasons. Oh no. Yeah. I, sure I remember their actors are also busy right now. So that probably has a lot to do with it. Yeah, I remember reading an article uh, about it, and they actually basically said, like, they think this was it, uh, the past season. By the way, anyone who hasn't seen China, Illinois, it's basically about the worst college ever. And um, basically, Hulk Hogan is the dean of the <laughs> of the school. And, uh, uh, you know, he, vo he voices the dean of the school, but he basically is playing himself in a, in a, in a, in a way. Uh, the show is hilarious. It's, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, the humor is just oh, bananas, like. <laughs> you don't you just you never see the joke coming like Brad Neely who's the creator is he's like I genuinely think that he's a genius and I absolutely think that he's a comedic genius for sure so what are some of the things that you know you learned about writing so I know you, you know you're a writer too obviously so you know what are some of the things that you learned from the show that you try to put into your own writing or maybe some of the things that you learned just from any of the writers in the show. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, you know, on China, um, I, I kind of came on after the writer's room was sort of over. So um, most of the learning process was really from Brad himself. Um, and then prior to that, um, on Huge, I was working directly with both Winnie and Savannah, who were writing and then um, was familiar with their writer's room. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's tough. It's sort of every show has... Um, has their own style and has their own different things that they like to do. So, you know, I think, um, I, I, I suppose the things that I've learned have, have been more, um, more about, you know, the, I guess the dealing with like networks and studios and sort of the, the business side of the writing, I suppose has sort of been more, um, what I've learned from those experiences because a lot of the time, um, and as a writer too, um, you know, a lot of the time writing tends to be done in isolation. So you sort of are in a room with a computer creating your story or your idea or your characters. Um, and you're not really engaging with people in a big way. So I wasn't like, in the room while, um, you know, Brad was writing a script, you know, I was, I was there when some ideas were being spitballed around, but I wasn't really necessarily there, like, while he was sitting there typing out his next line of dialogue or whatever. Um, so for me, it was a lot of learning about, you know, working with networks, working with studios, um, you know, taking notes, um, learning how to do that in, uh, in a respectful and, um, appreciative manner, which I think is really important as a writer, because even though the writing process is done in isolation, really nothing else in the industry is. Um, like pretty much everything else in the industry requires other people and their input and collaboration. And so 
for writers, uh, you know, a big thing that I talk to the writers that I give notes to um, about and a big thing that I sort of try and train myself to do is to just not have a really big ego about it because at the end of the day, there will be rewrites. There will be a lot of rewrites. You'll have to change things. Um, you know, you can't get too attached to any one line or any one character or any one scene because it's going to change. And so I think that's really maybe the biggest lesson that I took away from it was really just having that kind of humility um, when you go into these kinds of bigger meetings or, um, you know, recognizing that the job of it all is sort of under the auspices of somebody else and that kind of at any moment, like that job could go away and it's pretty much up to them to tell you notes and it's up to you to take them. So um, as a writer and even as a showrunner, you're really definitely still under the control of the network and or studio. Um, so that's definitely a big thing that I learned from from both of those writers' assistant jobs. Using your own projects as an example, yeah. you know, um, you uh, you know, I'm looking at your IMDb actually right now. Sure. Um, you know, <laughs> so uh, you, uh, you know, you did Snapshot yeah. and you did Santa Baby in 2010. Yeah. You know, um, was was there any sort of? I mean, both of those are short films, by the way, uh, to to people listening. Um, so w was there any like major changes you have to, you had to do with those? I mean, granted, you had more control, but you know, as you know, as we all know, things change yeah. at the spur of the moment. Totally. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, with you know, there there actually weren't. Um, both of those projects. Um, Snapshot was a co-write with um, Savannah Dooley, who I later went on to assist on Huge. Um, and uh, you know, I sort of did the first vomit draft, and then she came in and really polished it up and made it really fantastic. Um, she's just an amazing writer. Um, so that was like the biggest change was really her kind of second draft pass. And then we kind of just went from there. Um, and then Santa Baby, I wrote myself um, and it ended up winning like second prize in like a Las Vegas um, script contest, which was very exciting um, at the time. And then that one didn't really change either, um, come to think of it. I think that sort of, uh, you know, both of those scripts sort of kept their um, their storytelling pretty much the same as they were in their first or second drafts. But I think a lot of that came down to me either directing or producing or, um, you know, having oversight on those areas as well. And um, it's pretty rare for a writer to also be their own producer. So... Yeah, I mean, I think for those projects, um, there actually weren't that many rewrites. And uh, yeah, Snapshot did actually pretty well at festivals, considering that we didn't actually even do that many rewrites. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were we were pretty excited about that one. But no, there weren't actually. It's sort of funny to think about that now, because um, I am in the midst of rewrites on a bunch of my projects that are longer. But uh, for the short film side of things, I haven't actually experienced too much of that. Just to piggyback on that that question, then you know you you've produced uh, some other movies as well, yeah. and you know uh, what are some of the things that have you know has there ever been uh, something that has happened on, on set that has made you have to change like you know a location fell through at the last minute or it started to rain uh, you know is there anything that while you know you were wearing your producer hat that that something sort of catastrophic happened? Yes. Um... <laughs> I can talk about it. I'll talk about it without naming the movie because I don't want to call anybody out. But um, okay. <laughs> so shortly after I graduated from Columbia, I was working on a project um, that was shooting in upstate New York in the winter. And um, it was in like the middle of like blizzard conditions, like it was snowing every day and it was icy and it was cold. And, um, you know, the central climactic moment of that particular movie was a like 14 year old girl um, helping a horse to give birth. And we sort of learned over the course of the week while we were shooting and we were actually shooting on a horse farm that belonged to a family member of the director. Uh, but we learned during that week, something which I didn't know, which is that you kind of can't predict when horses are gonna give birth. Like it just sort of happens. So, you know, there were pregnant horses on the farm and they, could have given birth that week but as we got farther into the week we learned that they actually weren't going to like the vet was basically like we don't think that this is going to happen this week so you sort of get your like 20 minutes of warning and then it happens but like otherwise you're sort of like going by a lot of guesswork and um 
we basically learned on like day four out of seven or something that like it wasn't going to happen. And there was supposed to be a day off for the crew and the cast um, on day five, essentially. And instead of a day off, um, basically, I had to find a horse farm in the area that had another horse that looked like the main horse that we had been working with the whole time that was pregnant that we knew would give birth that day um, and send the crew there essentially and hope that the locations looked similar enough that it would match um, because we couldn't do a location scout or anything. Uh, And and we did it. I mean, we found a horse that was going to give birth and the 14 year old girl who was our lead or she might've been a 15, she was young. Um, but our lead, uh, helped the horse give birth, um, that night. So we, we did manage to make it work in the midst of a blizzard in New York in the middle of winter. And it was insane and probably the hardest shoot I've ever been on. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would say that that was pretty catastrophic when I learned that that horse was not going to give birth and that I had to find a horse. So how long did it take you to find a similar horse? Um, shockingly, not as long as you would think. Uh, we were actually in horse country, um, but this was sort of like pre, I'm going to like date myself right now, um, but this was sort of like pre like internet days. Um, like there wasn't like a lot of internet access where we were and like we didn't have like cell phones or the Wi-Fi or anything. Um, so I like had to use like the landline, um, to like call. And I, I was using like the yellow pages to like call like horse farms in the area. And like, there were actually a lot of horse breeding, um, facilities in the area because we were right near, I think Saratoga Springs, which is pretty well known for, um, horse racing and horse tracks and stuff. So there were actually a lot of breeders and farms in the area and we ended up having the option of two different places by the time I got done with my phone calls after about, you know, an hour of phone calling around. So it actually didn't take that long. Um, it just was, you know, one of those moments where your heart just drops and you're like, I don't know anything about horses. (laughs) Like, I don't know what to ask. I don't know who to talk to about this. Like I know nothing. So, um, that for me was, you know, I, so it's sort of, they say like, you know, don't do movies with like animals and children, basically. Um, especially if you don't have like a giant budget. And that was definitely one of those moments where I just, you know, your, your heart just drops. You think, you know, all right, well, we're not going to get this movie made. Um, but we did. We got it made. <laughs> <laughs> it looked great. I mean, you know, the, the birth was fantastic and it was real and it was shot on, and we were shooting on film. So we didn't have the, um, option to like do a lot of retakes or you know anything so it was just yeah it was it was pretty wild yeah you know those pre-internet days uh i remember you know filming some of my projects you know pre-internet days yeah. uh and i i mean this was like 2007 2008 yeah. and even then i mean like yeah. that's when cell phones were starting to come starting, become big but like you still had to like pay a lot for like five yeah. minutes <laughs> Yeah, and they were like the big candy bar phones, yeah. or like the Razor, the Crazer. But um, uh, there was you no know, service I, anywhere, so like you had to be in like a city for anything to work. Yeah, and it, and it just you know, trying to find different stuff was harder. Now I you know it, it's like going on to eBay, for instance. I can find obviously I can't find a horse, but I mean I yeah, can find most of what you know, you so need many for props you can like get for like a dollar. Yeah, exactly. Or or you know I can find where the latest you know one one place I always tell people to shop for props. Um, I don't think it's, it's probably not that good anymore because apparently they've, they've caught onto this, but, uh, the Goodwill stores, oh, totally. uh, because, but like I, I hear now what they do is they have a person who's back there and they put all the good things, uh, they save them, uh, to, so they could put them on their online store. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. So I, I, I you know, but it, I, I could still find like different props for almost nothing. Yeah. Like, you know, like I need a uh, a statue that we don't mind if it gets broken. Yeah. Uh, oh, here's one for two dollars. All right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of there's so many tricks that you end up using, especially as a producer um, that just kind of come into play over and over and over again. And that's one of them for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find the the best skill for a producer is besides in, but besides having a network. Um, which is a skill in itself that I found, but also being as resourceful as possible yeah. because 
Uh, you know, I have worked with some producers who I am in all of who some of the things that they got. I mean, one producer I know got a Porsche, uh, I think it was Porsche or Lamborghini, one of those companies to airdrop a brand new Porsche or Lamborghini to the set for yep. a shoot they needed. And they, and, and they actually paid for it, meaning Lamborghini or Porsche actually paid to have it respray, uh, repainted and had it airdropped. And I was like, my God, how did you finagle this? Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, some people I, I've just, you know, work with have been, I've just, you know, I can, can do it all. And then, uh, you know, we all have a stories about working with bad producers too, yeah. who just sort of, uh, yeah, we do. yeah. I have one person I, who, who I'm hoping to have on. He has one of the worst producer stories I've ever heard. He'll be on probably, you know, God, for months from now. But anyways, back to you, Miranda. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have a tendency to go off on other yeah, topics. So <laughs> no, I wanted to ask, you know, you started Script Chicks, uh, you know, with Sandra Levitin. You know, I wanted to ask, you know, what are some of the reasons that you you, know, you started your own company to, and, and, you know, what are some of the services that you offer? Um, yeah, totally. Uh, so Script Chicks, uh, we started about three years ago, um, and I think um, we're probably going to actually be wrapping it up pretty soon, um, but we both still do coverage on the side, so we're still kind of, like, open for business, but, like, technically. Um, but essentially... The main reason we started it uh, was we had both walked away from our jobs at the time. Um, I was working as a coordinator at a indie film company, and she was working at a coordinator level um, in television. And we essentially both left those jobs to go out on our own and produce. And um, we were sort of saying, you know, all right, well, what are we going to do that we can pay the bills and keep the lights on while we're producing, uh, you know, cause obviously, especially when you're producing indie projects, um, and when you're starting at the short level, which is where we were starting, um, you know, nobody's going to hand you a check for that really. Like you kind of have to hustle yourself, you know, um, and generally like even with crowdfunding, you know, as a producer, if it's your own project or as a director, if it's your own project, you usually will crowdfund, but, you will rarely include a salary for yourself because you recognize that like that's your passion project and you kind of have to pay everybody else to be there. But like you often don't get paid. Like we, you know, put our own money into our last project and, you know, we weren't getting paid on it. And it's sort of the same with my next project that I'm doing. So um, essentially we knew that like this was going to be a few years of hustling really hard and you know we needed something that we could do on a freelance basis that would permit us to still be producing and be writing and be directing so script checks was kind of formed based out of all of that um, and wanting to be able to provide a service to writers because we'd both worked in development for about a decade apiece so a combined about 20 years in the business of development and reading scripts and uh, we knew that we could provide that service and provide it well. Um, you know, we had clients who have gone on to sell shows to the CW and ABC and Hulu and um, ABC Family and Dimension and, you know, James Wan and like any number of people and places. So like we've had a lot of clients that have gone on to do very big things. So we we knew that like, you know, should you follow our notes and execute well, like you have a pretty good shot of doing well and getting signed and, you know, being, being pretty good. So um, that was something that we sort of all, you know, together felt that we were going to be doing it on our own and we sort of joined forces to do it together. So that's sort of how Script Chicks was born um, was that sort of need to keep the lights on and keep working and keep active in the industry, um, but also be able to produce and direct and write on the side. That's great, you know, because you always have to have that stream of income. Yeah. Um, and then when you're, you know, you're a producer or, you know, anything, when you're doing it full time, you know, you have to have multiple streams of income. Uh, you know, I actually, I, I took a course one time um, and this, this, uh, this speaker kept saying that every millionaire that he's ever worked with had seven streams of income. Wow. And that, and he kept harping on that because that was sort of like the, uh, that that was sort of like the minimum number of, you know, how do they get to be millionaires? Well, they have seven streams of income. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, like, the first one wasn't like the first, the top three weren't their job. It was, um it was like number four or five or six was like their full-time job. But the rest was like Absolutely. from different investments. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. And that's sort of the, you know, that's the thing. It's like, how do you get the passive income? So 
that's definitely, yes. you know, the, that's the end goal, I think, for a lot of us in the, in the business, especially um, above the line is to really figure out how to get those residuals coming in. Yes. And, uh, you know, speaking of which, you know, you currently have a GoFundMe campaign yeah. to, you know, sort of fund your next project. Yeah. So, you know, could you talk a little bit about your GoFundMe campaign? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm doing a GoFundMe right now. Um, I, you know, like I said, sort of at the beginning of the podcast, um, really got into this to be a director. That was sort of the end goal, big dream, you know, um, beyond the writing and producing side of things, which I love to do, but um, which weren't, you know, the passion from when I was quite young. Um, and the last project that I directed, um, it probably thinks that it was Santa Baby, but I think it was actually Snapshot. Um, but that project did actually pretty well in festivals and it went to Outfest and we went to Palm Springs and we went to a number of festivals around the world. Um, and we're very excited about that one. Um, and then shortly after that, I ended up sort of in the world of full-time work and then founding script chicks and working on producing. And so I realized uh, sort of in the middle of last year that it had been a little while since I'd actually directed anything, um, despite the fact that that was sort of, you know, the primary goal of me getting into the business to begin with. Uh, so I wrote a short um, in November that got really positive uh, feedback from, you know, my very trusted readers, because, you know, like I tell all my writer friends, you know, get a reader. And I have a few who are, I trust, you know, implicitly to give me good notes, because I don't want yes men, I want people who are going to tell me like, fix this, you know. Um, so I did a script back then. And I've gotten really great responses from pretty much everybody who's read it. Um, it's an action piece that uh, follows a female undercover cop who robs a bank for the mob, um, but then finds herself on the run from her former partners. So it's got some interesting twists and turns and uh, it's definitely action packed. Um, and I essentially started um, the process before I'd even started crowdfunding by sending it out to uh, my friend, um, James Kyson, who um, played Ondo on Heroes, and then he was really interested in the project. And then um, I sent it out to another friend, Pia Shaw, who was just on Grey's Anatomy and has done um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and a few other semi-recognizable, um, you know, TV shows and films. And she's just an amazing actress, and they're both just so talented. So... Um, you know, for me, um, the project has five characters and I've now officially cast two of them. Um, I have a hopeful third waiting in the wings. Um, and I'm really just excited to do something action based. Uh, you know, a, a big thing for me is diversity and women in the industry because the numbers are really low and they're really bad um, right now. And we've been hearing a lot of that in the media, obviously. Um, you know, the New York Times has covered it and there's investigations um, by the Equal Employment Commission and, you know, pretty much there's a lot of stuff going on um, about women directors and minority representation. And, you know, with Oscars so white, that's obviously an issue as well. Uh, so it's something that has been close to my heart for a lot of years. Um, and it's something that I think this project is going to allow me to sort of um, take head on in that I will be doing a project with, uh, I think the majority of cast will be people of color and, um, you know, obviously as a woman, I will be behind the camera. Um, so it's pretty exciting to be doing something that is really just a flat out fun action thriller. Like there isn't some secret hidden social message within the movie. Like it's not, you know, trying to challenge the status quo from the inside. It's literally just a really fun action movie uh, that just so happens to also be really diverse. So that's sort of um, always been kind of like my way of addressing political situations is that I, I don't want to preach to anybody. I don't want to tell anybody how they should think or what they should do. But um, I really just want to make entertaining product that promotes diversity, um, you know, behind and in front of the camera. So that's sort of been always my message. And I think that this project is going to really be able to do that. Yeah, I remember, you know, uh, reading in your GoFundMe page that you were uh, hoping to create something like The Raid. Um, and I was like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, because The Raid is an awesome movie if you haven't seen it, anyone listening to this. 
Yeah, I'm I'm a huge action fan. Like I will go see pretty much any action movie on like opening weekend. So whether it's like White House Down or The Raid or Olympus Has Fallen or San Andreas, like you'll see me there on opening weekend. Um, I'm just an action junkie. So uh, those kinds of movies are, have always been something that I've loved. And um, this one definitely is taking inspiration from from those for sure. Miranda, we've been talking for about, you know, like 30, 40, almost 40 minutes now. So in closing, is there anything you wanted to maybe add or anything you sort of wanted to say to sort of close out this entire conversation? Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it's just, it's really exciting. First of all, thank you for having me. So it's great to be able to talk to you. Um, you know, you meet a lot of people on Twitter, but don't always get to actually speak to them. So that's fantastic. And I love your podcast. So I'm really excited to be doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I would hope that um, anybody listening would get something beneficial from this. Um, you know, we've had some good discussion about the film industry and what's going on behind the scenes and in front of the camera. And, um, you know, if anybody wants to hit me up, it's easy to find on Twitter. I'm um, at Miranda Sajak and Sajak is spelled as it should be, um, S-A-J-D-A-K. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, my crowdfund is gofundme.com slash Miranda directs. And, um, I think those are it. I mean, that's sort of, you know, the gist of it all, but I'm, you know, always happy to answer questions about screenplays and the industry and what it's like and my projects. And I love hearing what other people are working on. So I'm, I'm pretty open to just having a chat. So. And, uh, everyone, I will link to all of, of those links in the show notes. And which you can find at DaveBullis.com. Um, I know some subscribers to Podbean and iTunes usually kind of comes out garbled sometimes. So again, if you go to DaveBullis.com, I promise it will they will be all there, all nice, all ready to click on. I follow Miranda uh, Miranda on Twitter, and uh, we're we're big Twitter pals, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I meet so many people on Twitter, and I, I really try to engage on Twitter. I. I I mean, that's sort of like my favorite social media site. Yeah, me and I, I always try to talk to everyone I can um, who's not like a spam bot or <laughs> some kind of porn bot. I get those a lot, too. I and... those too. What's that about? <laughs> They're showing yeah. up suddenly. I don't know. It like they come in waves. Yeah, they do. And... I'll get like four at a time. I'll be like, whoa. Yeah. And it, and it, it, sometimes, though, it's it's hard to decipher between the two because one was just like this this girl. She had a normal name. She was like, she said she was a social media ninja oh, and all this okay. other stuff. Yes, I think I've, I have her. One of those. <laughs> and then all of a, her. Yeah, and then all of a sudden she's like DMing me like, hey, go here and we can date. I'm like, what? I know. What is, you know? I get like the, I'm a cam girl, like click here. And I'm like, really though? Like, are you? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Miranda, it has been great talking to you. Everyone, you can find me at DaveBullis.com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. You can follow me even if you're a porn bot, as we were just saying. <laughs> Miranda, I want to say thank you. And uh, I want to wish you the best of luck with your GoFundMe campaign and uh, you know, with all your future projects. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks for having me on. Uh, my pleasure. And uh, I look forward to having you back on sometime. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When you finally finish this movie, when you get everything raised, I want, to, I want you to come back on. You can talk about the, uh, the project. Awesome. All right, great. All right, Miranda, I want to say thanks again and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.